working. As I was saying um, earlier today, um, I've been an audience member in many of the talks and it's nice to move to the podium because I've learned so much from the speaker series. So today um, I'm going to be giving a talk that's taken from my new book that I'm working on called um, Crack in Los Angeles, Policing the Crisis and the War on Drugs. And it's a paper that draws from different parts um, of the book that is trying to look at the role of resistance played in the drug war. So my um, new book is a product of my previous scholarship on the Black Panther Party. And when I was originally researching it as a graduate student in UC Berkeley, it was in the late 90s and early 2000s. And it was a time when there had very little history had been written of the Panthers and it, it really predates the mass mobilization of the movement for black lives. There was anti-carceral activism in California, but it hadn't found this broad based mobilization that we really take for granted today. So this paper reflects um, my interest in trying to understand why it was so hard to build opposition to the drug war when it was happening at the time in Los Angeles. And very importantly, the role that the Gary Webb revelations played in mobilizing the local community in Los Angeles against the drug war. So in some ways, this talk is gonna link the story that's probably a less familiar story about organizing against crack itself and the critical account that radical activists had about how the drug economy had affected vulnerable communities in Los Angeles. And then in turn, how that anger was deployed against the war on drugs. So, um, I'll just give an overview of three major points that I'm going to make in this talk. The first is about how African Americans mobilized in LA in the 1990s around an investigative news series by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Gary Webb entitled The Dark Alliance Series that argued that American intelligence services had played a foundational role in the exp expansion of the crack economy in America's second largest city. This was extremely important throughout the 80s and 90s, that while a group of black radicals, many of them former members of the Black Panther Party mobilized against police violence and the drug war, they found it difficult to create a broad popular base. Strikingly, it was the public discussion of the state's implication, the crack economy itself that fueled outrage at the time. So much so that the director of the CIA, in the late 90s, John Deutsch, of course, Democratic administration, was actually forced to come to, South Los, come to South Los Angeles and address residents. As we will see, this was without precedent. Um, the second part of the talk is gonna deal with the architecture of federal, of federal drug criminalization and the crack crisis and the war on drugs. I look at federal architecture of crack criminalization and its profoundly racialized nature. The Reagan era simultaneously witnessed in a period of intense anti-communist foreign policy and warfare accompanied by a vastly accelerated hyper-incarceration fueled by crack sentencing laws, mandatory minimums, and a range of new, new punitive measures and institutions. So what the talk will be doing is actually bringing foreign policy and domestic drug criminalization into the same lens. Finally, no story is complete without looking at the nature of resistance to state action. The final sections of the paper look at how the crack the CIA coalition politicized the web story and turned it into a larger forum on the sta on state sponsored crime and violence. So one of the important discussions and kind of mobilizing elements in the crack the CIA coalition was defining the state as criminal. So while we're seeing this mass criminalization of black and brown residents in Los Angeles, they invert the terms of criminality and direct it at the state. As he sat on the impromptu stage in South Central's Locke High School, CIA Director John Deutsch, a former MIT provost with a PhD in chemistry, looked profoundly uncomfortable, if not downright self-conscious, in his transparent, his transparent plastic glasses and dark blue blazer. A soft doughy quality marred his face, punctuated by a dimple-hearted chin jutting out from enormous spectacles. At first glance, he looked much more than the late middle-aged science professor than the director of the CIA under Bill Clinton. Congressman, 
Congresswoman Juanita Millinder McDonald presided over the town hall meeting, along with two California representatives from the House Intelligence Committee, Julian Dixon and Jane Harmon. The encounter between the CIA director and African American and Latino residents of South Central on November 4th, 1996 was unprecedented. Not since Watergate or the Kerry Commission hearings on the Iran-Contra scandal had there been such potential for government embarrassment. Since the explosive revelations from the San, Mo San Jose Mercury News journalist Gary Webb's Dark Alliance series in mid-August 1996, anger in South Los Angeles had been steadily building until it reached a crescendo at the Watts High School. Drawing on federal grand jury testimony, Senate hearings before the Select Committee on Narcotics Abuse and Control and FBI teletype documents, Webb alleged that there was a direct link between the CIA supported Nicaraguan Contra forces and Los Angeles's transformation into the quote, crack capital of the world. With the tacit compliance of the US government, Webb wrote, Contra supporters Oscar Danilo Blandon and Norwin, Norwin Menenses sold between 2,000 and 4,000 kilos of powder cocaine to Los Angeles distributors throughout the 1980s. Anti-communist Nicaraguan exiles then used the illicit proceeds to help fund the Fuerza Democrática Nicaragüense, Nicar Nicaraguense's bloody civil war against the leftist Sandinista government. Webb stressed that while a whole generation of working class black and brown youth languished in state and federal prisons for low level possession and sale of crack cocaine, both Blandon and Menenses who worked as CIA informants escaped without serving significant jail time. Black Angelino's fury about the CIA's alleged culpability in South Central LA's booming cocaine economy created an immense public relations dilemma for different departments of state in response to the rapidly escalating media scandal, as Webb's story went viral through the new medium of internet distribution, the CIA took the extraordinary step of dispatching its director to South Central, an urban area that had suffered the worst effects of the heavily militarized war on drugs. While many people angrily addressed John Deutsch, one woman's testimony conveyed particular gravity. Dressed in a dark gray suit with carefully pressed hair and glasses, the mother of three gently congratulated the CIA director for coming to LA before launching into a sweeping indictment of the drug war and its effects on black youth in LA. Quote, thank you so much for being here because we have needed this. The drugs have been coming in the country and they have been sanctioned by the government. In Baldwin Village where I live, there are no jobs for the children and our, chil and our kids are commodities. They are being cycled into the prisons. They come back to the street and they are marked and scarred for the rest of their lives. That's the pain of it. Her voice rose steadily as she described her son's futile search for employment after serving on a nuclear submarine for the US Navy. Quote, my son came home and had no way to get a job. Because he's black, it has to stop. And I hope that you will put an end to it because we are tired, we are hurt, and we are angry. Her, te her tearful commentary summed up the pain and outrage many black and brown Angelinos felt about the effects of mass incarceration and the drug war on youth of color. South Central's outpouring of protests was much larger than that against Deutsch or even the CIA. It spoke to the need for a public reckoning with the US government's perceived culpability, not only in the war on drugs, but in supporting policies that engendered violence, illicit economies, and the crack crisis itself. Grassroots mobilization in Southern California in the late 1990s addressed the myriad ways that black residents felt the drug crisis had touched their lives. While political organizing in South LA during this period contained an implicit critique of the war on drugs, it focused more on state culpability in the crack economy itself. Organized protest inspired by the web story mobilized long-standing radical networks forged during the Cold War that understood US anti-communist foreign policy, not only as culpable for the drug crisis in LA, but as damaging to the larger post-war project of black liberation and decolonization. Radical activists in LA saw the controversy over Contra cocaine as an opportunity to mobilize residents against US covert action abroad and the drug war at home. And I just wanted to emphasize here, this is really um, a story that I found doing 
uh, oral history interviews and also archival research. And I was very surprised. I was looking for a story that was more about domestic mobilization against the war on drugs. But the place where I really saw the kind of broadening of organizing from the circle, small circles of radicals into the general pop, black pop, really the black and brown population of LA happened around the web story. And this was a real source of surprise for me. And so these portions of the book are an attempt to understand why this particular dimension of the story became so important to the story of resistance. A diverse group of organizers came together under the banner of the Crack the CIA coalition, including former members of the Black Panther Party, Sandinista Solidarity Groups, the Communist Party, the West Coast branch of Stokely Carmichael's All African People's Revolutionary Party, AAPRP, and radical drug researchers, Alfred McCoy, Peter Dale Scott, and Jonathan Marshall. Over the next two years, they worked tirelessly to publicize state complicity in this crack crisis. Ultimately, in response to their organizing, Congress Maxine Waters demanded hearings before Congress and the release of both parts of the CIA's Inspector General report on Webb's allegations. The mainstream press ridiculed black residents' protests as irrational paranoia and disinformation. However, this largely forgotten moment in LA history played an important role in delegitimizing the overlapping wars on drugs and gangs. One of the confounding problems facing social history of the war on drugs is that despite its devastating effects in terms of racialized hyperincarceration, many of the grassroots groups organizing against police violence and criminalization had great difficulty in mobilizing a popular base of support in the 1980s and 1990s. Certainly the history of mass rebellion in LA in both 19, 1965 and 1992 gave voice to the enormous anger at law enforcement. Nevertheless, activists found it difficult to harness this power into a sustained campaign against the onslaught of carceral policy and legislation. Interestingly, it was the web revelations that generated much of the pushback against the Reagan and Bush crime policies in Los Angeles. And so there's a time gap here. So Webb is writing about the early 80s, but of course his story is released in 1996. So the 90s is really the story of this expansion of resistance. Um, interestingly, it was the Webb revelations that get generated much of the pushback against Reagan and Bush era crime policies in Los Angeles. It was the idea that the state could be the ultimate source of crime stripped the war of drugs of its legitimating rationale and brought together a coalition of local radicals who influenced a segment of black electoral politicians to retreat from their earlier embrace of the drug war. Um, in order to understand um, this campaign on the West Coast, we must attend not only to the foreign policy dimension but to the architecture for the domestic drug war, which emerged simultaneously with the anti-communist wars in Central America. The Reagan era war on drugs laid the foundation for the extreme criminalization of crack use and sale. Although LA proved to be one of the most important theaters of the late 20th century war on drugs, the developments in the city cannot be understood apart from the national push to criminalize crack cocaine. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the architecture of crack cocaine criminalization, how it fits into the war on drugs. Approaching the regional history of crack in LA's metro area is inseparable from the intensification of the federal wars on drugs and crime in the preceding decades. In 1984, Congress's passage of the sweeping Comprehensive Crime Control Act reinstated the federal death penalty and instituted revised guidelines for asset forfeiture allowing municipal police departments to seize up to 90% of the cash and property of those accused of drug sale. Equally damaging was the legislation's federal mandatory minimum sentencing folded into the CCA's many layered expansion of federal anti-crime powers was the Sentencing Reform Act that established the United States Sentencing Commission, which served as an independent agency of the judiciary that fuel fueled draconian drug and crime policy in the years to come. The SRA also abolished parole in the federal system and set judicial review. The United States Sentencing Commission erected a real offense system mandating that judges consider additional evidence about a defendant's conduct apart from the direct circumstances of the conviction offense. Prior to these guidelines, the judge had the option to do this 
However, the SRA mandated it. Congress's punitive measures had many carceral effects, including financially incentivizing local police departments to make more drug arrests, as well as vastly increase powers of federal prosecutors who could use the threat of onerous sentences to extract guilty pleas from defendants. While the provisions of the CCCA transformed the federal system of criminal justice, arguably the criminalization of crack cocaine possession and sale in the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986 and 1988 represented the tip of the spear of the late 20th century war on drugs. The federal government erected a punishing legal architecture for criminalizing crack use and distribution during Ronald Reagan's second term. The overblown rhetoric of the president and first lady, the media and congressional hearings themselves fed a kind of hysteria that prompted sentencing guidelines that had no basis in pharmacology, public health, or even previous anti-drug policy. Instead, crack functioned as a powerful cipher that rationalized the war on drugs itself by signaling racial fear and the phantasms of racial, of phantasms of violence, pathology, and communicable disease that accompanied it. In July 1986, several months prior to the ratification of the Anti-Drug Abuse Act, H.R. 5484, the Senate Committee on Governmental Affairs held special hearings on crack cocaine. The near universal alarm sounded by the committee's bipartisan coalition spoke less to crack's effects on urban populations of color than to the anxiety that its destructive effects could not be contained and were rapidly spreading to youth in suburban and rural communities throughout the US. Although congressional testimony did not explicitly reference race, the colorblind approach to crack, which set it apart from all previous drugs and sentencing provision in the late 80s, contained a covert use of a racial dog whistle. The chairman of the Committee on Governmental Affairs, Republican Senator William Roth of Delaware, opened the hearings on crack cocaine with a dramatic monologue that likened cocaine to a social pandemic. Quote, in medieval Europe, thousands of hopeless people died from the plague. In the United States in the 1980s, thousands more could die by their own hands from an equally deadly white plague, the plague of cocaine, explained Roth. Quote, those whom it doesn't kill, it destroys in other ways, ruining their health, impairing their ability to reason and function, and ultimately driving many to lives of crime and violence in order to feed their tragic addiction to a series of temporary and empty highs. Senator Lawton Childs echoed the sentiment, sentiment, quote, crack is spreading, it is affecting our children and grandchildren, and it is igniting a crime wave. The Florida Democrat closed his prepared remarks with the ominous summation that crack is, that quote, Crack is jeopardizing our youth. It is monopolizing our police. It is terrorizing our communities. Refusing to be outdone by his colleagues, former astronaut and celebrity John Glenn, now a Democratic Senator from Ohio, went so far as to compare the patterns of drug use to the spread of nuclear arms. Quote, the proliferation of crack cocaine highlights, if not symbolizes, the nature of the menace that we must combat. Virtually unheard of a year ago, this cheap, purified, and highly addicted form of cocaine is sweeping the nation and is now just beginning to make its presence felt in my home state of Ohio. The escalating rhetoric forged a bipartisan coalition on punitive drug policies as Democrats sought to outflank the president's supporters in the midterm elections. The anxiety about crack's effects on children became a potent theme in the, in the hearings, with particular care placed on the proximity of manufacture and distribution of open air drug markets to elementary schools. The head of the NYPD's anti-crack unit warned Congress about the drug's detrimental effects on generations to come. Quote, crack dealers are underwriting the future market for their deadly commodity by attempting to sell this to our children. Moral panic paved the way for sentencing enhancements for drug transactions within a thousand or 1500 foot radius of a school. Drug free zones with long roots stretching back to the early 1970s caused disproportionate prosecution of people in urban areas where density of public infrastructure meant that whole swaths of the city prompted sentencing enhancements for drug possession and sale. Built into the federal sentencing mandates for crack cocaine was a confounding logic that never explicitly, never explicitly referenced race but had profoundly racialized effects for drug users and low level retail workers in the crack economy. It simultaneously targeted those on the lowest rung of drug sales while radically reducing penalties for sellers of large amounts of cocaine powder. In this sense, it not only disadvantaged low level drug retail, 
but advantaged their wealthier whiter counterparts. Given the marked race and class stratification in illicit drug markets, this had profound consequences for racially disparate sentencing and incarceration. In 1986, prior to the passage of the Anti-Drug Abuse Act, the average drug sentence for African-Americans was 11% higher than that of whites. By 1990, however, it was 49% higher, having increased fourfold in just four years. Several glaring anomalies marked the passage of the 100 to 1 sentencing disparity between, uh, crack, between powder and crack cocaine. The first and most important was the speed with which its sponsor rammed the bill through Congress. Lawton Shiles bragged, it's historical for the Congress to be, it's historical for the Congress to be able to move so quickly. Child's boast, boast was an actual understatement. The, bu the bill, moved so rapidly that it was excluded from the committee review process and left behind a marginal record of debate and no committee report. The House held a handful of hearings which recommended a 50 to one powder to crack disparity based on the interviews with DEA agents. However, the Senate conducted only one brief hearing for a few hours after which they doubled the ratio to 101. The American Civil Liber Liberties Union observing this process wrote, the abbreviated legislative history of the 1986 act does not provide consistently cited rationale for the crack powder penalty structure. A former staffer from the House Judiciary Committee described a frenzied atmosphere, quote, I'll see year four and I'll raise you five years. It was the crassest political poker game ever. And of course its timing was crucial as the midterm elections rapidly approached a hard line stance on crime proved self-serving for Democrats and Republicans alike and a move that anticipated Bill Clinton's return to Arkansas to oversee the execution of Willie Ray Rector before the New Hampshire primary in 1992, public officials created as well as reflected racist hysteria that would have far reaching implications for incarceration. Strikingly, Florida politicians played a crucial role in the legislation. Republican incumbent Paula Hawkins, who ironically lost her seat to the Democratic Leadership Council founder, Bob Graham, a couple of weeks after the Anti-Drug Abuse Act's passage, justified the expedited process through recourse to military defense. Quote, drugs pose a clear and present danger to America's national security. If for no other reason, we should be addressing this on an emergency basis. The speed of the sentencing disparities passage abetted a pharmaceutical fiction that went unchallenged as politicians created new drug policy out of whole cloth. One of the many false assumptions that the 100 to 1 sentencing disparity hinged upon was the idea that crack represented a quote, purer form of cocaine than its more expensive counterpart powder. Given the very creation of crack entailed, given that the very creation of crack entailed adulteration in which small amounts of cocaine hydrochloride were mixed with water and baking soda, this was a remarkable conclusion. Under the new law, in contrast to how state prosecuted drug drugs like methamphetamine, all of the adulterants counted towards the total weight adjudicated in sentencing. A mere five grams triggered a mandatory sentence of five years. Politicians use this false conception of crack's comparative purity again and again, and in the congressional hearings in the months leading up to the passage of the Anti-Drug Abuse Act, Senators Sam Nunn, Lawton Childs, and William Roth referred to the alleged purity of crack over a half dozen times. The supposition had no basis in chemistry as the psychoactive agent in both crack and powder was identical. A decade later, the United States Sentencing Commission acknowledged this fallacy, drawing on data from the DEA and the National Institute for Drug Abuse, NIDA. Crack cocaine is generally not, contrary to popular belief, 100% pure. Rather than book baking soda and converting crack cocaine remains an adulterant in crack after conversion, reducing the purity of report concluded. DEA laboratory analysis during the mid 1980s showed an average powder cocaine purity of more than 80%. Subsequently, as NIDA tested samples from across the country in the mid 1990s, some proved to be as low as 50%. The Omnibus Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988 further expanded this punitive mandate by establishing the Office of National Drug Policy and making the first time possession of five or more grams of crack, roughly equivalent to the weight of a quarter, 
an automatic mandatory minimum of five years and a maximum of 20 years in prison. For the second offense, three grams triggered minimum sentencing and one gram for the third offense. The exceptional nature of Crack's prosecution revealed a punishment structure distinct from all other controlled substances. Under HR 5210, for example, a first offense for heroin possession of any amount prompted a maximum sentence of a single year in prison. However, in the years to come, as scholar Naomi Murkawa has argued, disparate crack sentencing had a multiplier effect for all crime policy. Quote, Sen sentencing guidelines incorporated the 100, 100 to one ratio between crack and powder cocaine established by the Congress the preceding year. And to maintain proportional punishments, the US Sentencing Commission inflated other criminal sentences to accommodate the new higher benchmarks of mandatory narcotic minimums. So I just wanna stress that in that sense, this disparate crack sentencing influenced all of the anti-drug prosecutions that it raised the scale in an unprecedented way that in turn influenced longer sentences for all in the years to come. The federal government stood alone as the most punitive arm of law enforcement in the late 20th century war on drugs. In the wake of the Anti-Drug Abuse Act's passage, 14 other states adopted sentencing policies distinguishing between powder and crack, including a number of Southern and Western states, among them South Carolina, Alabama, Louisiana, Missouri, Oklahoma, and California. The latter sentences, the latter sentenced those convicted of possession with the intent to sell crack to three to four, three to five year terms of imprisonment versus two to four years for powder cocaine. Strikingly, none of the states adopted the federal government's sentencing disparity between crack and powder. North Dakota came the closest with its matching 100 to one ratio. But in contrast to the federal system, the state's mandatory minimum mandated no more than five years in prison. Ultimately, the threat of federal prosecution strengthened the hand of federal law enforcement and prosecutors at the state and municipal level because being sentenced to federal time meant not only longer prison terms, but also a 90% conviction rate. Faced with the higher prospect of such high rates of conviction, less than 3% 3 def 3 of defendants ever chose to go to trial. So I just wanna underline that point that the federal system is of course much smaller than the state systems. Most incarceration takes place at the state level, but because the penalties in the federal system were so enormous that it was often used as a kind of hammer to threaten defendants on when they were being prosecuted at the state level that their crimes, that they, their crimes could be escalated to federal prosecution. Even more shocking than the length of time prescribed for crack offenses in the federal system was the enormous scale of racial disparity and how authorities applied the law in different regions of the country. Between 1986, when the Congress signed the Anti-Drug Abuse Act into law and 1994, which is also the year of, of very importantly, Bill Clinton's crime bill, not a single white person in the Los Angeles metro area and its affiliated six counties had ever been convicted of a federal crack offense. And this is despite the federal government's own survey data from the National Institute of Drug Abuse demonstrating that over two thirds of crack users in the United States were white. Similarly, local arrest data in California showed enduring racial bias, while white youth between the ages of 18 and 28 faced a 30% chance of arrest Black youth in the same cohort confronted a 70% likelihood. When challenged with the conclusive proofs of racial disparity in federal drug charges, the Los Angeles special agent heading up the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearm denied discriminatory intent. Quote, to say we just target Black and Latinos because they are Black and Latino is just crazy. We try to go after the violence, the armed offender. And I would add that um, Los Angeles is not the only metro area in which no white people were convicted of federal crack offenses. It's also true for New York and seven or eight other metro areas. So these are the places that have the largest scale of drug prosecutions. And yet 
only African Americans and Latinos for the most part are being prosecuted with federal charges. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about, go back to the Los Angeles story of crack. In many ways, this work is going back and forth between the federal government as the center of anti-communist foreign policy and also the most punitive arm of the drug war. And it's going back and forth between that and the story on the ground in Los Angeles. Given black residents longstanding grievances against the drug war, the Gary Webb revelations in the 1990s catalyzed mass protests throughout LA, leading one journalist to like liken the story's explosive potential to the Rodney King beatings that sparked the 92 rebellion. In late September, 1996, just a month shy of the 10, 10 year anniversary of Congress's passage of the Drug Abuse Anti-Drug Abuse Act, the Cong Congressional Black Caucus and Stevie Wonder's station, KLJHFM, organized a meeting at an auditorium in the Crenshaw District. Over 2000 people showed up to demand government accountability for the crack crisis. Public demonstrations gave voice to a fear reach to a far reaching attack on the role of the state that linked the domestic drug war to foreign policy misdeeds of the Reagan administration. Local businessman and founder of the Brotherhood Crusade, Danny Blakewell, Danny Bakewell, brought the crowd to its feet when he demanded, quote, you, the government, gave them this dope to commit the crimes you want to punish them for. We want those responsible prosecuted and we want them to go to jail. Striking a similar, if more plaintive note, a young paralegal pointed to the enormous numbers of African-Americans serving lengthy jail sentences and asked, is it a war on drugs or is it a war on black people? The perceived hypocrisy in the war of, the perceived hypocrisy of the war on drugs became a boon to local anti-carceral organizing. In October, 1996, a rally was held with over 2,500 people and the anxiety about another urban rebellion was so high that the night before John Deutsch arrived in Watts to address Webb's allegation, even the Los Angeles Times, which had pilloried Gary Webb with over a dozen reporters tasked to document the inconsistencies in his story, warned the CIA director to be contrite. The newspaper published a forceful opinion piece by National Security Advisor Peter Kornblue that encouraged Deutsch to appease South Central LA by acknowledging that the CIA did in fact knowingly and willingly work with drug dealers. Webb's series and the wave of activism it inspired was all the more explosive because of the role that Los Angeles played in the national war on drugs and gangs. Through popular cultural representations and films such as Colors, Boys in the Hood, Less Than Zero, Menace to Society and Blue Thunder and so-called ga gangster rappers like NWA and Ice-T, the city had become synonymous with a vast illicit economy in crack and bombastic forms of policing to combat it. Testifying in 1990, LAPD police chief Daryl Gates told the Senate Judiciary Committee, the casual drug user ought to be taken out and shot. The chief of police was not alone in his assessment of the enormity of the drug crisis facing LA. In 1989, Congresswoman Maxine Waters declared, the most urgent problem facing ghettoized African-Americans today is the lethal infestation of drugs in our community. The roots of the crisis could be traced back to the early years of the Reagan administration. In December, 1985, the Los Angeles Times declared that Southern California, quote, the world's largest retail market for cocaine, for cocaine. According to California law enforcement, large scale drug interdiction in South Florida in the early 80s shifted transnational distribution circuits for cocaine from the US market. Los, Angel Los Angeles's size and relative proximity to cocaine producing regions exacerbated its longstanding drug economy. From 1984 to 1985, a sharp increase in the amount of cocaine entering the region was apparent. In 1984, DEA agents seized an average of 22 kilos per month. By the following year, the figure jumped to 125 kilos per month. At the same time, the price per kilo exhibited a steady decline, speaking to the essential logic of supply and demand in which even the most stringent forms of drug interdiction intercepted less than an estimated 10% of imported illicit drugs. As revelations by investigative journalists, Brian Barger, Martha Honey, Robert Perry, who passed very recently, and Gary Webb have shown, Los Angeles's crack crisis was, was integrally linked to the geo 
geopolitical dimensions of the American cocaine trade. In the fall of 1979, the Los Angeles Times announced that a cocaine snowstorm had hit LA. Sweeping north from Peru and Colombia, this onslaught of Indian cocaine initiated a sharp drop per kilo. As a result, prompted underground distributors to develop new methods for expanding the market from the drug's traditional wealthy elite to poor and working class people. A re-engineered mixture of cocaine, baking soda, and other additives known as crack or later rock was the result. In contrast to powder cocaine, this new substance was smoked and inhaled directly into the lungs, creating a powerful, if ephemeral, high. Even more important than the drug's pharmacological effects to its transformation was its cost. Initially dropping to $25 a hit in the early 80s, which at the time was considered unheard of for cocaine, as the river of illegal Andean cocaine flowed into an ever greater scale in the US through Reagan's first term, the price of an individual unit of rock cocaine soon dropped to $5 per hit. Anti-communist drug trafficking networks forged during the Contra War in Nicaragua and the Bolivian cocaine coup in 1980 helped explain the continuous growth in the supply of illicit drugs to LA and other regional markets in the US. Despite massive expenditures on the domestic war on drugs, the Reagan administration's support for Central American anti-communist forces exa exacerbated the crack crisis in the US. Both the competing aims of different state sectors and the transnational political economy of the Cold War were essential to the multifaceted dimensions of the late 20th century drug wars. The Contra cocaine controversy, as it became known by pioneering journalist Robert Perry, whose reporting in the 1980s prompted the Kerry Commission hearings, popularly known as Iran-Contra, Iran represented one of the rare moments in American history in which the continuum between foreign and domestic policy broke open. Domestic populations who had been devastated by a decades-long drug war voiced their fury at the American government for simultaneously fighting a militarized campaign against crack cocaine at home while creating the conditions for its explosive growth abroad. Quote, and this is from Gary Webb. While the FDN's war is barely a memory today, Black America is still dealing with its poisonous side effects, wrote Webb in 1996. Quote, thousands of young Black men are serving long prison sentences for selling cocaine, a drug that is a drug he charged that was virtually unattainable in South Central before the CIA-sponsored Contra War created new distribution networks and bargain basement drug prices throughout the city. Um, so now I'd like to turn to the final part of the paper, which is about the genealogy of resistance. And this is about the activists on the ground um, that really gave the Gary Webb story wings and how they were linked to longer histories of black power and black radicalism in LA. Organized protest against contra cocaine had its roots in a tradition of radical anti-drug politics that could be traced back to the Black Panther Party's firm stance against heroin and other forms of what they called illegal capitalism in the late 60s and 70s. Los Angeles had a diverse mix of former, former Black Panther Party members drawn from the Southern California branch, as well as from other cities, including Chicago, San Diego, and Oakland. They articulated a critique of the crack crisis that harkened back to the New York Panther Party's response to heroin in the post-war years. The BPP condemned substance abuse as a symptom of social defeat and internal colonization. Michael Sedaway Tabor wrote, quote, drug addiction is a monstrous, monstrous symptom of the malignancy which is ravaging the social fabric of the capital system. And this is from a famous pamphlet written by Michael Sedaway Tabor called um, Capitalism Plus Dope Equals Genocide. Quote, it is, it is a social phenomena that grows organically from the capitalist system, argued Tabor. Rather than supporting the declaration of a virtual national state of emergency in the Nixon years, Tabor saw police as complicit in the expansion of destructive illicit economies. The, quote, the play could never flourish in black colonies if it were not for the active support of the occupation forces, the police, he argued. In his view, the war on drugs and the expansion of police powers it enabled did nothing to protect vulnerable populations. Instead, such campaigns rationalized state repression by providing a pretext for the prosecution of radical activists, such as Lee Otis and Martin Sostra. 
After the dissolution of the Black Panther Party in 1982, former Panthers carried these ideas into other campaigns and political tendencies. Arguably, the most enduring voice against state violence in Los Angeles was former Black Panther Michael Zinzin, who co-founded the Coalition Against Police Abuse, CAPA, in 1976. By the late 70s, the Black Panther Party was in free fall, still suffering the effects from a decade and a half long campaign of state repression. CAPA's charter members also recognized, however, that how also recognized how the authoritarian democratic centralist structure of the Panthers Oakland leadership contributed to the group's decline. So the Coalition Against Police Abuse is founded by a Southern California Panther and it's a number of other Panthers move into this organization. So they carry kind of Panther ideology but also recognize some of the, the, the limitations of the framework. While drawing on the anti-capitalist and anti-statist tendency of, of the Panthers, Kappa sought to build a multiracial organization without a fixed system of hierarchy. Its motto, quote, we will work with you, not for you, reflected a preference for egalitarian decentralized styles of organizing. Starting out with a handful of participants in the late 1970s, Kappa compiled documentation of police abuse and murders in LA using statistics, photographs, media clippings, and interviews. When the LAPD, under pressure from the coalition and other police accountability groups, released a list of its employees of color, Michael Zinzin noted that 13 of Kappa's past and present members, including his own secretary, were on the police department payroll. In 1981, with the ACLU's assistance, Kappa filed a successful lawsuit against the Los Angeles Police Department, charging that LAPD's Public Disorder Intelligence Division, PDID, had violated their civil, liberty, civil liberties. On the eve of Los Angeles's drug war, Kappa and its fellow plaintiffs won a $1.8 million settlement that ultimately led to the disbanding of the PDID. Unfortunately, this victory proved short-lived when the anti-terrorist division, ATD, replaced its predecessor. In 1984, after attempting to intervene in, in the assault of another man, Michael Zinzin was beaten so badly by the Pasadena police that he lost sight in one eye. Despite these setbacks, Kappa and its small circle of activists continued to teach community members how to document police abuses, utilize media attention, and wage legal campaigns during the height of Los Angeles' drug war. While the coalition created an intergenerational channel for organizing, it never succeeded in building a large base in South Central LA. However, in the early 90s, Kappa gained greater visibility in the aftermath of the Rodney King beatings. As a bridge between an older generation of black power radicals and younger Angelinos, Kappa's most important role was as a clearinghouse for new activist formations. The coalition worked so closely with the organizers of the community in support of the gang truce that they literally shared their offices. In 1996, Kappa nurtured an even more powerful challenge to law enforcement by working actively with the newly formed Crack the CIA coalition. When the US Civil Rights Commission subpoenaed Zinzin in 1996 for a hearing on police abuse in LA, he insisted on testifying about new evidence on CIA complicity in local crack distribution. Although most of the mainstream media dismissed the crack the CIA coalition and the Congressional Black Caucus's efforts as a wave of black paranoia, Webb's revelations and the organizing it inspired played a critical role in shifting black political discourse and the war on drugs in LA. Formed in the years after John Deutsch's visit to, the, to Los Angeles, the Crack the CIA coalition attracted an eclectic mix of longtime LA activists and organizers, including the red diaper baby, Deacon Alexander, black power activist, Daydon Kamati, mother country radicals, Sabina Virgo and Michael Novick, along with, local, with a local Filipino businessman and activist named Fernando Fernando. By co-sponsoring marches, rallies, media events, and lawsuits, the Crack the CIA coalition helped mobilize anti-drug war protests in Southern California and in black communities across the country. One participant remembered the coalition as a particularly meaningful for its ability to pull together a multiracial international group of people who had rarely worked together in the past, 
Their meetings reflected the organization's diverse makeup as they rotated monthly meetings to different parts of the city from South Central to East Los Angeles, the West Side and the San Fernando Valley. Between 1996 and 1999, the Crack the CIA Coalition worked tirelessly to politicize state culpability for the so-called crack epidemic through regular demonstrations, educational programming, letter writing campaigns, litigation, and targeted outreach to state officials in Oakland and Los Angeles. Its tight cadre bridged intergenerational tendencies of the city's threadbare left of the Clinton era. The coalition struggle to mobilize a popular base highlighted the challenges confronting radical activists in the long years after the civil rights movement and the Cold War. In a city sharply divided by race and class in which a generation of black elected officials from Mayor Tom Bradley to the left-leading city councilman Robert Farrell had supported sweeping punishment campaigns against drugs, gangs, and crime. The Crack the CIA Coalition redefined the city's drug crisis as the direct product of state action. Given the resurgence of the culture of poverty discourse to explain rates of incarceration and drug use among a Los Angeles's poor and working class residents of color, the coalition's use of the Dark Alliance series proved particularly subversive. They gave voice to a powerful counter history that located the extreme criminalization of the city's most vulnerable population in government violence and corruption. Not only had the state prosecuted a brutal drug war, but agencies within it had helped to facilitate its very rationale. S. Deacon Alexander, one of the coalition's early participants, hailed from a prominent black communist family in LA. Known simply as Deacon, the youngest of seven siblings migrated with his family to the West Coast in, early, in the early 1950s after FBI harassment made life in Chicago nearly impossible during the McCarthy era and anti-communist hysteria of the, Cold, of the Korean War. After attending the, event at John Do after attending the John Deutsch event at Locke High School, Deacon Alexander invited a group of fellow activists to begin organizing around the web story. They soon began meeting regularly and formed a loose coalition. Daydon Kamati, formerly Kenneth Samuel Carr, was one of the most active of the charter members of the coalition. He, had, he was a seasoned political organizer who passed through some of the major tendency of the post-war black radical movement, shifting from the Black Panther Party to revolutionary Pan-Africanism in the mid 1970s. The son of a black American Naval officer and a South Asian mother from Trinidad, Daydon had grown up moving frequently as a child, living in Philadelphia, New Jersey, and New Jersey before receiving his undergraduate degree at UC San Diego in 1972, where he joined the local chapter of the Black Panther Party as a sophomore. Carr took postgraduate classes at UCLA and subsequently joined the All African People's Revolutionary Party founded by Kwame Ture, formerly Stokely Carmichael. After a brief stint in East Africa, he returned to organize student chapters of the AARPRP on historically black colleges and universities in the East Coast. The former Panther enrolled in a PhD program in the philosophy department at Howard University, where he led an effort to derail the awarding of an honorary doctor of laws degree to Vice President George Bush by Howard President James Sweet in May 1981. The AAPRP had been working on an international campaign targeting anti-communist US foreign policy entitled Smash the CIA. With its roots in Kwame Ture's activism on the African continent, the self-identified revolutionary socialist organization was outraged by US intervention in Congo, Chile, Ghana, Iran, South Africa, and the Ethiopian civil war. Despite student protests and Dadon's tireless organizing efforts, the former CIA director, George Bush Sr. did become the commencement speaker in 1981. However, protests disrupted his talk. Over three dozen graduates turned their backs to the stage as Bush began his address while the others waved red flags and handkerchiefs. And um, I just reached the 45 minute mark, so I will be concluding very soon. Kamadi returned to Los Angeles in the early 80s, just as crack or just as rock or crack was becoming visible on the streets. His own experience with freebasing informed his subsequent activism with the coalition. He later described how the novelty of smoking rather than ingesting or injecting cocaine popularly known as rock or ready rock left many vulnerable. Quote, smoking had not been done anywhere to my knowledge. This was brand new. There was no history of struggle against it. 
of common black folk culture, street culture, telling us this was bad, explained Kamati. Quote, there were certain cultural forms we developed to protect our people and our children. We had none of that. We had it for a lot of different things, alcoholism. We didn't have it for this thing called freebasing. Drawing on his activism at Howard, Kamadi worked together with Sabina Virgo, Armando Martinez, and other members of the coalition to sponsor popular rallies and educational forums throughout the late 1990s. By collaborating with a network of radical drug scholars, the group held regular teach-ins and demonstrations that became a larger venue for discussing state violence, foreign policy, and the drug war. The Crack the CIA's coalition most, most successful public event was for a protest march uh, was a protest march in front of the Times Mirror building uh, to City Hall headline, Stop the CIA Flow of Drug into Our Cities in February 1997. The symbolism of starting at the LA Times was incredibly powerful given the newspaper's foundational role in debunking the Gary Webb story and promoting sensational crime coverage that helped drive the regional punishment campaigns against drugs, gangs, and crime. The march attracted over 4,000 attendees and brought together an amazing range of people from local churches, the Beverly Hills Hollywood uh, NAACP, the National Council of Negro R Women on the one hand, and the Bus Riders Union Green Party, Comité de, de Base Sandinista, the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador, and the Democratic Socialists of America on the other. Film industry luminaries, John Singleton, Edward James Olmos, Ed Asner, Oliver Stone, and, ha and Haxel Wessler expressed support as did investigative journalist Bob Perry and longtime radical activists and scholars, Russell Means, Tom Hayden, Angela Davis, and Mike Davis. Large crowds of people marched through downtown Los Angeles chanting, the CIA, you can't hide, we charge you with genocide. And Ollie North, we say no, CIA has got to go. And all 120 organizations joined the coalition or sponsored its demonstration. A shared sense of community grievance united the participants in the Crack the CIA coalition, many of whom have had suffered personal losses from substance abuse, state sanction and private violence. As the Crack the CIA coalition sought to politicize the drug war and the culpability of US foreign policy in the crack trade, they increasingly turned towards truth and reconciliation committees as a vehicle. United States work in El Salvador and Guatemala provided a model, as did human, uh, human rights investigations in South Africa, Rwanda, and Eastern Europe. Coalition members understood their utility as a means to confirm, quote, widely held beliefs about what has happened and who was responsible. The Crack the CIA coalition discussed establishing a Citizen Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Los Angeles entitled the US, drug, the US War on Drugs, Who Profits, Who Pays. Core inquiries included how the drug industry operates, government culpability and drug trafficking, and finally, the social impact of the US War on Drugs, including the militarization of communities and disparities in how the criminal justice system was carried out. So now I will be concluding. Crack cocaine had several lives in Los Angeles and other areas throughout the United States. The most subjective and elusive was how it was ex how users experienced it, while the second encompassed the informal economy of its consumption and trade. The third and perhaps most foundational was the state and media was how the state and media conceptualized its dangers and criminalized its use in profoundly rationalized ways. To this end, authorities authorities selectively deployed narratives about crack and communities of color to rationalize punitive drug war policies. However, radical activism in LA during the late 1990s inverted the process of racial criminalization by, by identifying the state itself as a progenitor of crime. The Crack the CIA coalition articulated anger at all levels of government, not only for its direct suppression, policing and incarceration, but also for the ways that the state engendered some of the most destructive forms of social harm. Co-founder Dadon Kamati summed up the impulse behind the the Crack the CIA Coalition's organizing strategy that challenged the drug war's coded use of crack. I made a decision to popularize the notion that when you think crack, don't think black. When you think crack, think white CIA. Thank you. Well, thank you, Donna. Um, so that was a really powerful and rich history. Um, we have now approximately, well, just under, let's see, a, a little under 
uh, 30 minutes for questions and answers. And so there are, this is how we're gonna proceed. So if you look at the bottom on your toolbar there at the bottom of your screen at the far right hand side, there's a, a reactions option. And if you click on that, it'll open up and you can uh, raise your hand, which will alert me that you wanna ask a question. If you're a little, and, and what I'll ask you to do is to activate your camera and microphone so that you can go on camera uh, and we can record your question. If you're a little shyer, you can uh, use the chat function, which is further to the left on the, um, the toolbar and I'll read out your question. So is there anybody who'd like to go first? There's always this moment of silence as people prepare their thoughts of the questions they wanna raise. All right, um, Ed Powell, go ahead. Can you, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and activate your camera. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a, a camera activation button here. Oh, oh here, here you go. Yeah. Uh, thank you much for a uh, uh, very interesting talk. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I was just wondering who invented crack? Um, I asked the question in the chat also. Uh, some people say it was uh, Black people who invented it, and that's why they had control over it. And that was the reason why it was being suppressed, because they were the controllers rather than the traditional people who control distribution. Is that true? And then uh, secondly, is Kappa related to BLM in any historical perspective? I don't know. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for those questions, Ed. So the first question is that we really don't know the precise origins of this mixture of combining crack, uh, combining powder cocaine with baking soda. Um, many people attribute it to so-called vernacular chemists um, in the early 1980s. One of the important things about this is that this new form of cocaine was integrally linked to the drop in price. So I think rather than the attribution of specific people's involvement is about why it happened. And it happened because essentially cocaine had gone through this transformation. In the 1960s, there's a discussion essentially among public health scholars and doctors at Yale University who talk about cocaine as not representing a public health threat because it was so expensive. So the idea is that its expense was an, um, uh, a barrier to its widespread adoption and usage. So the price was so inherent to how cocaine was understood, but it's in this period after the Sandinista revolution and essentially the formation of the Contras, also the Bolivian cocaine coup plays an important role in this, that these anti-communist wars happen at the same time that we begin to see the expansion of the amount of cocaine entering the United States. So no, I don't think we can attribute it, uh, the use of baking soda, adding baking soda to uh, powder cocaine to black people, but an earlier predecessor to crack became popular in Central America in the early 1970s, which was um, produced through kind of an intermediary process of turning you know, plants into cocaine. And it was, uh, it was a kind of mixture that could be smoked. So there are some precedents for the development of crack in the early 80s. It first appears in the Los Angeles Times in 1983 and in the New York Times in 1985. So I think that there's a whole piece of this history that will never be fully leg legible to us. you know. And that is the place where you often see narratives being created about origin. The question about BLM is an excellent one because I started working on this project maybe a year before um, 2011, 2012, right at that period about of the murder of Trayvon Martin uh, in Florida and the formation of the Dream Defenders and the tweet that gave birth to Black Lives Matter network. And there's no direct, there's no direct connection between this earlier um, organizing, which is deeply rooted in the Cold War. And I think that one of the ways that I think about this uh, as a Panther scholar 
is that the Cold War is an important uh, dividing line between the activism of an earlier generation and the activism that we see today. So in some ways, the Crack the CIA coalition is most connected to the history which precedes it. So, you know, the radical anti-war movement, the story that I told through telling the story of Dadan Kamati and Deacon Alexander of different tendencies of the black left, which were repressed and purged uh, because of both anti-black ideas, but very importantly, anti-communism. So even on the crack the CIA coalition is formed after the Gary Webb story in 1996, its real roots are forged in this earlier period. So you have Deacon Alexander coming out of the communist party in LA, drawing on these communist circles uh, in Los Angeles. And then you have the Panthers who are part of the so-called new left who identifies Marxist Leninists. So in some ways it's a story that goes from the past into the 1990s. Um, that said, I think BLM is important to this story because it's actually in this period, almost 10 or 12 years, well, it's technically what, 15 years uh, since the Gary Webb story, something like that, 16 years, so almost an entire generation, that we're able to see a mass mobilization against the carceral state and the popularization of prison abolition and these new ideas that are delegitimizing de the drug wars and what we would call the modern carceral state. So I don't think they're directly connected to each other. They have a different political genealogy and history, but knowing what we know now for the years after the 1990s and the crack the CIA coalition, this is when we see a kind of mass mobilization around these issues. This is something I'm still turning around in my mind and trying to understand. One of the ways that I've thought about it is that we have a lot of scholarship on the long civil rights movement or long black freedom struggle and the black power movement. And one thing that we see is that it takes time for people to develop new strategies of, resi of resistance against particular racial regimes. Very difficult to organize in the 1980s and 1990s. But if we extend our timeline to include really 2011, 2012 forward, we have seen the largest protests in American history take place around the theme of Black Lives Matter which, although it is explicitly about state violence and police killings, I would argue it's a larger indictment of this whole edifice of the carceral state. So we do see a mass mobilization, but we don't see it in the period in which these things are happening. And so the first real wave happens in 1996 with the Gary Webb story. I think that in general, we need to have more of a discussion about kind of the black radical left during the Cold War and then how it fits with the kind of activism that we see today. All right, excellent. So who would like to go next? Uh, I currently don't have anyone in the queue, either in the um, having raised their hand or in the chat. Again, those are your two options. Okay, here we have somebody. Alan Ruff, a local historian, would like to ask a question. Alan, if you could activate your camera, go ahead. Sure. Thanks, Patrick. I was wondering if, if uh, you could talk about the relationship between the war on drugs and the militarization of the police, which is still very much uh, visible and more dangerous than ever. You, you uh, quickly mentioned Daryl Gates. Uh, he first won notoriety for putting together what became known as a SWAT, a SWAT to attack the Panthers in Los Angeles, for instance. I think it was Los Angeles. Um, but that connection is very much a part of the larger war. Yeah, Alan, thank you so much for that question. I think we had Max Felker Cantor on the call. I'm not sure if he's here now, but he's written a wonderful book called Policing Los Angeles, which I think is one of the most important works, you know, that will trace this history of policing in Los Angeles and the connections between um, the war on drugs and police militarization. In some ways, I think to understand police militarization, we have to go back to the 1960s and to the both the urban rebellions and the formation of the Black Panther Party. So the Black Panther Party is formed in 1966 and it's founded in Oakland, but then it later expands across the country. And the Los Angeles chapter of the party um, was important and it is attacked by the Los Angeles Police Department in 1969. And it is, uh, it is attacked by SWAT, which was the 
really a new kind of police institution. It was explicitly only staffed with veterans who had fought in the Korean War and in the Vietnam War. And it was the strategic weapons attack team. It was a vision of a militarized policing that would be used modeled on um, foreign counterinsurgency. And very importantly, it was first used against the Black Panther Party. So SWAT is founded after the Watts Rebellion in 1965. So in looking at police militarization, it's very clear that it is accelerated as a response to radical Black organizing. In terms of the war on drugs, we don't have a declaration of the federal war on drugs until the early 1970s. So in some ways, this, this process of police militarization actually predates the federal war on drugs in 1970 and 1971. However, uh, once you have the declaration of the war on drugs, you have with the war on crime also in 1965, federal monies that are being used by local police departments. And this use of uh, federal monies to buy hardware. Um, in the case of the attack on the, the Southern California branch of the Black Panther Party, they actually wrote to Camp Pendleton to see if they could get a, a tank and grenade launcher to be used against the party. They didn't use it, but that request was nevertheless made. So I think that the, uh, the repression of uprisings and of this simultaneously, I mean, the Panthers are attacked because they are a black radical organization, but also because they're communists. So the Panthers are kind of a convergence between the anxiety around uh, communists, uh, you know, at the height of the war in Southeast Asia, and also racism. So I think that police militarization, um, it is actually, it is the predecessor to what we see with the national war on drugs. Thank you. All right, excellent. Um, looks like we have another question from Viola Dean. Viola, if you could activate your camera and microphone, thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Viola and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Thank you so much for your talk. It was so, so interesting. Um, I am, I work in harm reduction. And so when I'm thinking about the war on drugs, that's something that I can't not think about and not bring up. Um, and something I'm wondering about is, do you, I don't, yeah, I don't know. How do you, do you see any way that harm reduction can be systematized in a way or um, like how, how can we use harm reduction um, with the, when we're talking about like militarization of the police and the war on drugs and things like that. Um, because I can often think about it in a working with clients way, but I have a harder time other than just basic education and things like that, um, really thinking about how I can, how police, for example, are going to become more believers in harm reduction. Um, for me, that's how I see this um, as a, a helpful solution in this problem, not a complete solution, but at least a start. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think that first, that the public health lens is an incredibly important and powerful lens for opposing this punitive, you know, I talked about, you know, when I was talking about the language that's used in those Senate hearings, you're literally having a language of plague combined with nuclear pro proliferation. I mean, this is the kind of demonization and um, panic that can produce such violent repression and response. So I think the most effective way, both in the period and also today, is to counterpose a question of public health. So looking at um, reinserting the humanity of people and the importance of life and viewing it through the lens of healing and recovery in which you don't have this essential demonization and stripping of humanity and fear-driven discourse, which is what enables violence. So I think that that's crucial. I think that some of the history of harm reduction that needs to be written is a broader and more inclusive one that includes also kind of the popular history of harm reduction in, among uh, black radicals. So of course you have Matulu Shakur who was treating drug addiction with yoga and with acupuncture. 
So these kinds of community-based based methods of harm reduction. And I didn't talk about it. I talked about capitalism plus dope equals genocide with Michael Setaway to bore, because you have an interesting anti-drug um, philosophy or even ideology coming out of the Panther Party because they saw their focus was not on targeting users. They were concerned about the hyper-capitalist hyper nature of the drug economy itself. So I read some of the kind of harsh rhetoric about that, but there's also a counterpart to that in the Panther in the New York Black Panther Party itself, which is seeing that the real solutions are social transformation. So their argument is that it's actual revolution, that drug addiction is produced by, it's an ill of capitalism. People need jobs, people need full employment, and also indicting, arguing that the police and structures of repression are directly linked to the hyper-capitalism of the drug economy. And so its solution is social transformation, but then also these uses of acupuncture, of non-allopathic medicine and ideas of healing. So yes, I agree with you and thank you for all of your hard work. I think harm reduction is absolutely essential. We have to figure out also how to translate harm reduction for our own communities in ways that it can be seen and heard. Because one of the difficult things also about the crack crisis is that many of the communities that were experiencing it, they weren't taking this from the language of the federal government or the panic of the media. They were seeing the ways that their loved ones were being affected by this drug. And so, for example, I live in Philadelphia and there's been really important harm reduction and the creation of safe spaces. But sometimes you have communities where you see higher rates of drug use that are fearful of the distribution of needles because they see it as potentially furthering an economy and, a, and, and practices that have been hurtful to them. So I think the work of translation, you know, and looking to communities' own histories of resistance. That's why I included that long quote from Daydan Kamati, who's a member of the Crack the CIA coalition, but he was also a former user. And so he was talking about how one thing that made crack so difficult is that the community had not yet developed its own ways to protect itself and to talk to one another. So if that makes sense. I think we have multiple histories of harm reduction. All right, nicely done. Uh, so Jenna Lloyd has a question and Jenna is gonna go on camera. Hi Jenna, nice to see you. Hello, oh, there I am. Um, hi, great to see you too. Thank you for your talk. Um, I see there are a lot of questions, so I'm gonna restrain myself to one, um, which is, um, I think you really, talk very compellingly about how strong the anti-imperial um, uh, element of this organizing was. And I wonder, and that's, I wonder like what lessons you would draw from that contemporary organizing, because that seems to me like one of the areas, I'll just share my opinion, that actually could be, could be strengthened and could, could draw a lot of, in terms of contemporary abolition that could actually um, um, draw a lot from um, this anti-imperial history. Certainly there are anti-imperial elements, um, but I think they can be strengthened. So I wonder if you could speak more about that. Thank you so much for asking that question. It's so important politically. And I was reminded also when I was at Robin Kelly's three brilliant talks that I think it was in the third talk that he talked about the importance of bringing back some of the lenses about how the international connects to the domestic and really the attempt to stop not only violence at home, but US violence abroad. And since you asked about the contemporary, I think maybe I'll place myself in history. You know, I'm coming of age in the 1990s, very influenced by the first Iraq war. Uh, was involved in organizing against and was devastated by its declaration and similarly by the second Iraq war in 2003. And so I came out of a generation of leftists that were still really, we came of age during the cold war, right? So even though I was young, I shared a kind of understanding of politics that was shaped by the previous generation. So shaped by the Panthers. And that was really core to how I understood being a leftist, right? So be it the war in Vietnam or Southeast Asia or the violent hot wars, anti-communist campaigns in Asia and Africa, many of us were looking to the struggles in the global South as inspiration and also the intellectuals that it produced. 
So that was very much a part of my own formation. It's what one of the major reasons that I wrote about the Panthers, because I read Asada published in Cuba after she had, you know, and after she had escaped essentially a federal pen penitentiary in the United States. So the kind of global South was very, very important to me. But one thing I think is a challenge for a series of reasons. The first is the complexity of the cold, post Cold War moment. And I think we need to talk about that. There's a real division between people that experienced and lived in the Cold War and then the people that are born after. Um, one of the things I'm excited about is just seeing the birth of a whole new generation of BLM and BL activists and along with that anti-capitalists and kind of a new generation of leftists. You know, socialism has become something that students talk about openly and they're excited about it. Um, they're not always familiar with the depth of the Cold War. And so you see a, there's a fault line in the left about that. Many of us are really cautious, you know, because of the stories of repression. Um, I had to sign a loyalty oath when I was a graduate student at Berkeley that said I'd never been a member of the Communist Party. I'm not now, never have been a member of the Communist Party. So I think that's the first challenge is having an intergenerational dialogue in which we talk about some of this history and under the, understand the Panthers both as part of the black liberation struggle but also history of the left. They're Marxist Leninists, they talk about themselves as a vanguard party, they see themselves aligned with Castro and Mao. And so that piece about state socialism, it needs to be a part of the discussion. And I find that sometimes it's left out in some of the films, documentary films that have been made about it, that whole component for example, the Black Panther Party is not there. So that's one piece. The second piece is that I think really since the second Iraq war, Gulf War of 2003, um, and the election of Barack Obama, there's been a real collapse of the anti-war movement and the kind of the, not just the anti, the liberal anti-war movement, but the radical anti-war movement, I think there's a, a level of depression, I think, of the sense of our un inability to stop US aggression abroad. And all we have to do is look at Libya, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. And we have our 20 year anniversary of the uh, war in Afghanistan that there's been a kind of defeat of a, a lack of optimism about being able to stop wars. And I think this is absolutely essential that we need to build back the anti-imperialist, anti-war component um, of radical struggle. And I think ultimately for the kind of transformational domestic politics that we want, whether it's the Green New Deal or the reinvestment in public goods, we can't get away from the fact that what 65% of the federal budget is going for war, you know, essentially for military and military functions. So I think the question is how to rebuild that portion of the left and you see this, of course, in the politics of Bernie Sanders. There's a way in which we have collapsed into the domestic. And so as a historian, that's another reason I wanted to tell this story, to remind us of a period not so far from now in which people saw stopping anti-communist war as essential um, to people at home, especially vulnerable populations. I hope that answers your question. All right. Well, given the amount of time we have left, there, and there are a few questions, I'm going to try to do my best to sort of combine them, maybe. So most of these are questions about, you know, what what's come at the end of this story, in a sense. So um, one of them has, uh, it's a question about, um, were the um, agents of the CIA who were participated in the distribution of drugs ever punished? Someone else asked, um, where are we on the war on drugs today? And then a couple of people asked questions about Gary Webb. So one asked, can you speak to the CIA's subsequent and ongoing campaign to discredit Gary Webb and his reporting? Was, I mean, I was thinking that myself, just you know, to what degree has he been rehabilitated because of what we've come to know? Uh, and then somebody else asks, would you say the CIA campaign to discredit him and his findings failed then in the end if it galvanized such a powerful grassroots movement against the drug war. Do you find gangster rap and memoirs such as Monster, the autobiography and an LA gang member as complicit or at least obscuring the true power relations and drug economy in the early 1990s? Asking because this person was taught this book in a cultural studies graduate program, which in retrospect seems a misguided curriculum and potentially complicit in misunderstanding 
the transnational aspects of the drug war as well. Okay, well, I'll try to combine those in one answer. Yeah. Um, the first thing I'll say is, yes, I do think Gary Webb has been vindicated. The Los Angeles Times that was at the core of the attack on Gary Webb published a piece in 2006 um, <clears throat> by a local journalist who at that time was working in Orange County that essentially said the core facts of the Webb story were true. That, and even in the CIA report known as the HITS report, there's a, simply an acknowledgement that the CIA worked with assets who were involved in drug distribution. And the way that I explain this in class is that if you think of it this way, you don't need a conspiracy theory. You have an anti-communist war in which the federal government is providing funding to create the Contra Army in Nicaragua. At the same time, after the Sandinista revolution, the US is providing uh, shelter for the anti-communist regime that was ousted by the Sandinista revolution. So all of La Guardia, and the kind of anti-communist authoritarian politicians are given, uh, are, are given, you know, shelter and sanctuary inside the United States. And it's that infrastructure of the Contra army and especially of, of, um, of LaGuardia that creates a lot of the infrastructure for drug trafficking. And even in the CIA's own reports, it acknowledges this. There's just no question that the primary money being funded by the federal government, but also the kind of right-wing Nicaraguan community in the United States was funding the Contra army and that drugs were being sold to finance that army. That actually is not under dispute. What was under dispute were the specific facts. And this is why Gary Webb was attacked because he named names and traced a lineage directly to Los Angeles. And that's where you saw the attack on Gary Webb. But the LA Times that was primarily involved in the attack on him more or less said, mm, the framing of the story was a problem. The use of the crack pipe in front of the CIA logo, it was the sensational framing that was problematic, but the core reporting of the story was true. Now, I would say there's a political element to this which is that it was the mobilization of black people in Los Angeles that blew up the Gary Webb story. I do not think there would have been the same assault on Gary Webb had he quietly written this story as a national security reporter and it did not develop a popular audience. It was the way in which the Gary Webb story mobilized people and it mobilized people because it made that direct link that I made that number one, US is involved in anti-communist foreign policy. It's created the conditions for this huge expansion of cocaine and crack cocaine in the US. But at the same time, it is giving long prison sentences to you know, young people for drug offenses. So he made that political link of bringing those two together. So that's why I think he was attacked in the way that he was. He has largely been vindicated. Sadly, as uh, Jenna's question, too much of this history is a forgotten history of the of contra cocaine, Robert Perry passed recently, which made me very sad. So I think this is a history that we need to know. Um, I hate to end by talking about Monster, but yes, Monster is you know this was a New York Times bestseller. It was taught to me as a graduate student at Berkeley. It was taught in our U.S. history curriculum, but I think sadly it reinscribes a lot of the myths of the of the war on gangs. I mean, even the very assumption of the persona as a monster and the way that he talks about violence. You know, this was a carefully marketed memoir and this use of, you know, marketing of people's own experience, um, part of what made it a bestseller was its sensational discussion. So I think that we need to go back and interrogate, especially the gang autobiographies, which mix also with that question about particular commercialized forms of hip hop. You know, the NWA plays a role in this, the way that some of these fears and demonologies were marketed even by the people that were targeted by them. So I'd like to stop on a more uplifting note, but I think returning to this question of bringing together um, international Pan-Africanist um, organizing, which is certainly that, you know, that's what Stokely, the last half of Stokely Carmichael's life is involved in, bringing that back into the story of how we think about Black Lives Matter, that in international dimension matters a great deal. I guess I'll end just by saying that in many ways, the Cold War never stopped. This is important. 
that if you define it, the Cold War as being about the Soviet Union and the Eastern, you know, Eastern part of Europe, the Cold War stops in 1989. But if you look at, at the war against the continued anti-communist war, north to south, it continues. So in that sense, this is not simply a past history. Wow, well, this time has flown really fast and that's always an indication of how fabulous a talk is and a Q and A session is. Uh, it's unfortunate that it's now come to an end. Um, we're all, I'm sure, gonna be really anxious to see the book that comes as a product of this. Somebody actually asked, um, where can they get access to this wonderful paper? Um, is that a possibility or is it, is it likely to be published in the form that you just presented it? Uh, they will have to wait for the book. And I'm hoping to finish next year. I have a full year off and union duties willing. I'm hoping it will be in your hands soon. All right, excellent. Well, we are, we're all gonna be very happy to see that. And um, before we end, I mean, I should thank the uh, co-sponsor, which is the Afro-American Studies Department here at UW-Madison. But if we, were, if we were all here in person, we would give you a rousing round of applause but people can do that virtually. So um, you can do that in the reactions um, button again, or just you know, give an applause that way. So thank you so much, Donna, this was fantastic. We appreciate you um, ending our series this semester. It was a really good way to, to cap it off. Much uh, appreciated. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you all for coming. All right, take care everyone. <laughs>